Hey, what's up, Shoji? Hey, how's it going? Not bad. So, uh, hey, did anyone ever uh, reply to you about the tutoring thing? Uh, not yet, no. Uh, so, but I appreciate you. I'll start the recording. All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the final uh, colloquium of the fall 2020 semester. It's been a wild uh, semester. So our, our speakers uh, today are Dr. Nima Dinyari, who's the head of the uh, uh, industrial physics program at University of Oregon, a fantastic program, which you're gonna learn more about. And uh, our own Shoji Hasida, who uh, went through here as an undergrad, Smith Camp Scholar, worked in Dr. Pechon Ho's lab, and then has actually gone through the University of Oregon program uh, and we'll also, we'll be able to give you a student point view uh, of, of that program. So without further ado, uh, Nima, take it away. Thank you very much, Doug and everyone for being here. I'm gonna share my screen, <clears throat> let that load up here in a second. And I only have a few people on uh, my panel. So if, can you see the presentation uh, slides? All right, great. I'm gonna make it into full screen, so hopefully it looks better. Full screen, oh my gosh. Oh, view, that's why I couldn't find it. And then full screen. All right, so I blew it up there. So as Doug mentioned, my name is Nima Dinyari, and I'm the director of the optics programs in the Knight Campus Graduate Internship Program. So lots of things coming on here. Uh, we just recently were brought into a brand new campus called the Knight Campus, named after Phil and Penny Knight, who are the founders of Nike. They threw a lot of cash our way. They built us some new digs, and I can talk about that later. We're really excited about that. Um, so I'm the director of one of the tracks within this larger organization, and Shoji actually went through the semiconductor device fabrication track. I'm pushing the next button, but it's not moving. So let's see if I can get it to go. <clears throat> Computers these days. I want to change slides. Okay, it doesn't like that. So I'm just gonna go manually here, sorry. <clears throat> so we have a number of different tracks that make up this larger organization, the graduate internship program. And all of these tracks have uh, something in similar, which is they teach along uh, industrial lines or technological lines versus purely along academic lines. And what I mean by that is many of the challenges that industry faces is interdisciplinary. So people in the optics track combine skills from computer science, from physics, from optics in particular, but physics in general. Um, as well as uh, other engineering concepts that would be useful to someone working in this industry. So we teach along those industrial lines and we do the same in the other tracks and Shoji can talk about his experience in the semiconductor track in more detail, but we bring together chemists, physicists, chemical engineers, electrical engineers into this track. So that's one thing that makes this program very unique but you, you would earn an, uh, an applied physics master's degree in, the, in this program in the top two tracks listed underneath the material science focus tracks. The polymer science and the molecular sensors track, those are for people with a chemistry background. So if you're interested, we can talk about that. In the bioinformatics program, you would get a biology degree and uh, physicists would be competitive for that track and you don't you need to have a strong biology background, but uh, having a interest in biology would be important so that you're successful. And the skills that you would learn in that bioinformatics track can actually apply um, to a lot of other fields, but our focus would be on genomics, which has a lot of genetic data. And uh, usually you're not just uh, comparing one genome to a question, you're comparing uh, many hundreds of genomes to a question and uh, you get into large data sets very quickly. So we have these different flavored tracks and I'm the director of the optics track. Um, 
we can connect you with other uh, track leads. If you have specific questions, hopefully I can answer questions that come up here. But uh, another thing that makes this program uh, unique is that in place of doing research on campus, students do research in industry in a paid internship. So I'll talk that, about that a little bit more. But um, to focus on the things that we do a little bit different. So there's a lot of amazing uh, academic programs out there and they, pre they prepare you for uh, different trajectories. And our trajectory, oh, well, now my arrows are working, but they're going the wrong way. That's funny. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, we work very closely with industry to create our curriculum. So the programs have been around since the late 90s. We create new tracks or we refocus the direction of a track based on as industry evolves. So the bioinformatics track is a newer track. It started in 2011. The molecular sensors track had been around since 2001. After the recession of 2008, they uh, shut it down around 2012 because the companies were all getting absorbed into larger and larger companies and the market was changing and our program wasn't feeling so confident about placing st students in that industry. So we wanna make sure our students can quickly get into an internship and graduate. So we refocused that program into the new molecular sensors track and it was its second year as that track um, this year. So with the feedback of industry, we're able to tailor the curriculum, what you learn in the classroom and what you learn in the lab. Oh yeah, I'm trying to use the arrows and it's backwards. So, uh, so something that we uh, do uh, different is also add in some psychology that prepares students to work in an industrial setting. So an academic setting where learning, especially uh, fundamental uh, concepts, uh, whether they're already understood, like something you'll learn in a classroom that you know, as a physicist, you should have uh, a solid understanding of, or if you're working on a PhD and uh, discovering new things, you need more time to be able to learn or discover and understand those discoveries. So it's important in, a, in, in an academic time frame to give students or researchers that time. In industry, typically the time scale is, you know, depending on, you know, if you're in the semiconductor industry, it's every quarter. You know, Intel, Apple is posting their quarterly reports and they're putting out new products every so often and they're trying to increase their uh, profits to get more investors. <clears throat> to hold that market lead. And so the, the time scale and the focus is different. So we integrate this into the curriculum. Typically what we do is we compress the learning such that you're in the classroom and in the lab nine to five, Monday through Friday, and you treat it like a full-time job. You're doing one class at a time and we teach in a block series such that the concepts you learn in the beginning of the curriculum are necessary for the later parts. So that reinforces that learning. And you have to work in a team to divide and conquer to uh, be able to be uh, on time with your results in the lab. So you'll do your homework and work together on that. But, um, you know, everyone's going to get their own grade on their homework. But when you're working with a team on a project, and you have a deadline, the team will sink or swim together. So putting those concepts together in the lab space is, you know, maybe, you know, the most important thing that we do that's different, you know, then everything else molds to that in terms of how the program is going to operate. <clears throat> I'm in this default setting of pushing that arrow and it just goes to the first slide. So as I've mentioned, uh, on day one, you'll be in the lab. We'll go in the morning in the optics track and you'll do some lectures on how light travels through a lens. And then in the afternoon, we'll meet in the lab and we'll build a 
telescope and a video microscope and we'll learn how to align the optics and uh, you'll be learning concepts. Uh, you'll be reinforcing the concepts you're learning in the classroom. So that's you know fairly unique in, at, in graduate school and uh, we do it every day. Now that's in a typical summer this past summer with COVID we did things slightly differently and next summer we're going to do things slightly differently because the restrictions will be lifting and we've already been through one round of teaching in person so we're very confident that we can do it without anyone getting sick even under like the high pressure of the pandemic so we just had uh, our students make it through and you know we can uh, happily say no one got covid during the time at the u of o <clears throat> Okay, there's that default mindset that I can't break. So as I've mentioned, uh, students will be interviewing and securing internships to complete the research component of their master's degree. Many of our students will connect with their internships through our network, but we want to teach you the skills necessary so that in a year or two, uh, you could apply to new jobs and uh, be competitive in the job market as your career grows. So whether you need to um, worry about interviewing to companies outside of our network or just uh, interviewing with our uh, existing partners. Oh, thank you, Roger. Uh, <clears throat> then, you know, we want you to uh, have those skills in your back pocket for when you need them. So it's really important just like you're doing right now is you don't know where you're going to go in your career. Uh, so you need to learn all these different physical concepts uh, and give yourself a foundation, but also an exposure to them. So if you do pursue, let's say high energy physics, or if you go into astrophysics, you have that foundation. These skills that we teach in the professional development sense are like your foundation for uh, your advancement even if you don't ever have to apply for another job again you're going to get evaluated you're going to get reviewed you're going to get promoted based on your ability to communicate your achievements so it's an ongoing process and a lot of these skills translate into working in uh, science so you know communication is a generic statement and interviewing is a specific way that we communicate but uh, resume writing or presenting or writing a technical report, those are all communicating. And if you're in a group meeting and you want your idea to be heard and taken seriously, it you'll probably use similar strategies that you would use in, a, in a, if an effective interview, being able to be concise and get your thoughts across uh, efficiently. I use the arrow keys and nothing happened, Roger. I don't know what's going on. I, <laughs> so traditionally students will spend uh, their summer doing four graduate uh, courses in their core curriculum for the track they're in. So this summer we didn't do that. We taught the two core courses, which was all the theory and then we taught one elective course in design of exper experiments. And that's a really important class that combines statistics and uh, you know, data analysis, which I hear uh, is very important. So if you're in any uh, way able to learn those skills in undergrad, I would encourage you to do so. And uh, how do the design of experiments concept is how to explore large parameter spaces efficiently. And it was actually developed out of the semiconductor industry because the problems are so complicated in the semiconductor industry that you need a very efficient way to optimize the fabrication of your processor and your screen and all the components. Um, it would take forever to uh, use inefficient ways of exploring what's the best parameters for your experiments. So we taught that this summer and then in the fall, we taught the core lab coursework. Next summer, we believe we can go back to all four core courses being taught in the summer. 
In addition to that, students do the professional development I was just talking about, and that lines you up for our interview event. So this year, even though our students hadn't completed their core coursework, we still held the interview event at the end of the summer. And uh, our partners uh, come year after year looking for talent and they know we recruit really good undergrads and we have a very good program. So we were able, I was able to line up all but one student with an internship from that networking event, even though the students didn't have their research component. The one student who didn't uh, get a position declined an offer because of uh, where they wanna live and how much uh, they wanted to get paid. And that was a decision that they had to make and we'll still support them in finding an internship. Um, but we were pretty successful. So the market seems to be very strong for these uh, industries especially like bioinformatics and molecular sensors, which will play a big role in uh, life sciences and health sciences. So traditionally students will finish out their electives in the fall at the U of O and the design of experiments course would be one of them uh, as an example. It's, it's our most popular one because it's so impactful in your uh, career journey. And then uh, most students have their internship lined up to start in January. So as, uh, as a program where students will be doing research in industry and industry being very protective of their intellectual property, students uh, pay for their tuition and are compensated by the companies for their research. And that keeps the lawyers separated so they're not employees of the university and therefore the university has to negotiate how that intellectual property is gonna be divided up. So our ability to work with a lot of companies is based on the fact that our students are not employees of the university because they pay for their tuition. And that's very different than many other graduate programs that might waive the tuition because you're an employee of the university either being a TA or doing research for the university. So. That, that'll be important if you're interested in this program for us to discuss. So students are paid for their research, which is, you know, especially if you're coming out with loans and uh, you, you're concerned about, you know, being financially uh, safe, which I encourage everyone to be, uh, you know, the, our program, I'm gonna talk about the cost in a little bit, but whether you're in state or out of state, it's the same cost. It's about 32,000 for the entire degree, plus a couple thousand in fees. And that's been negotiated to be minimized because you spend a lot of your time off campus doing your research in a company. So you're not even utilizing like the gym and other facilities. Um, and I'll break that down in a little bit. But if we look at the, average salary of all of our tracks and we're, we have chemists working in Missouri and we have physicists working in San Francisco. So they're gonna be on different ends of the distribution based on their industry and the cost of living of where they live. Uh, the average salary was about $60,000. And this is, this is from the students in the 2020 cohort. So they haven't even started their job yet. I um, mean, the range was anywhere between $4,000 to $6,000 a month. So if you take that average and then multiply it by 12 to get this annualized rate, you would get $60,000, which is about twice that of the cost of the degree. Obviously, there's room and board, but uh, you know, uh, we think that this is a pretty good proposition. The majority of our students uh, get converted uh, at their host institution if there is a uh, space. If not, we work with our students to try to connect them with opportunities for full-time employment, um, depending on your constraints and uh, the market. It's a different story for everyone, but most students get their internships converted at their host company or land in an opportunity within three months, 90% uh, to be exact. And that's based off of our statistical historical uh, average, even including you know, the big recessions we've had in uh, 2008 and 9. 
So even if you want to get a PhD, we think this is a good way to go. We actually recruit from this program uh, to bring back students after they've gone in the industry and become very productive scientists and are a little bit more uh, self-disciplined and motivated than someone straight out of undergrad. They're kind of been sharpened by the industry. And if you do come back to the U of O, we have a scholarship which will reimburse you over the course of three years the cost of your master's degree, <clears throat> except for the electives. The electives, uh, we don't uh, have any control over. Those are typically taken outside of our um, ecosystem. So um, yeah, if you're interested in a PhD, <clears throat> this could be a way for you to see what industry is like. Maybe you're interested in material science and you want to see what a career is like in that before you dedicate it to getting a PhD. <clears throat> So I've broken the cycle. I'm now not pushing the arrow keys. <clears throat> so we recruit students from all backgrounds. We look for three things. We look for good academic success, you know, uh, good grades. <clears throat> we understand that people's grades might fluctuate. You know, maybe in your freshman year, you weren't as focused as you should have been. We care about your upper division grades in certain classes like quantum, ENM, stat mac, thermo. Um, and like differential equations, but obviously we like to see really good grades, but don't count yourself out if you've got a couple of blemishes on there. Don't sell yourself short. <clears throat> Research experience and employment experience. So having done something and, and being employable is really important for our program. And solid communication skills. <clears throat> Where we can assess that is in our program. If your paper application is accepted, we do a interview and there we assess your communication skills. And um, we do not require the GRE subject or general exam. Our deadline is February 15th. So that gives you quite some time to prepare your materials. And I recommend you reaching out to anywhere if you're gonna apply to grad school, especially if, if you're a sophomore or junior in here, don't be shy, uh, reach out, network and see uh, how the schools treat you when you're asking questions. And that could be a sign of, you know, you know how well they're gonna treat you as a graduate student. And if you're able to connect with faculty and ask them about their research, it's, it'll be really helpful, not only for you to know whether or not you wanna apply there, but for them to get to know you as an applicant. <clears throat> and then uh, our program starts in June. So at the U of O, we're in the quarter system. Students graduate on a Monday and class starts on a Tuesday. Don't ask me why they have graduation on a Monday. I didn't write the rules, but that's just how it is. So poor U of O students. So uh, let's see here, the costs. So as I mentioned, you're paying for your tuition and you get paid by the company. There's a total of 55 credits that you take. Um, eight of those credits are at, uh, are an elective course. So we offer some electives, but you might choose to not take our electives and we don't control the cost of like, let's say you wanna take it through the physics department or the chemistry department, they, can, they might charge a different rate. So let's just talk about that if it pertains to you later. But if you would imagine that you took all your credits through us at 575 a credit, and this is the cost in 2021 that you would pay. So this is projected to be the cost minus any fees, as I mentioned, it would be about 32,000 if you multiplied 575 by 20, uh, by 55. And that's spread out over 15 months or uh, five terms. So it's not like you have to pay all up front and we're eligible for financial aid, FAFSA. We also have scholarships to help bridge the gap between you starting the program and making your first paycheck in your internship. So before I wrap up, uh, I just wanna list, these are some of the companies, uh, these are the companies that our program has worked with in the last three years. So in the last three years, these companies have taken at least one student. A majority of these companies have been coming year after year um, I, don't, I hope you can see my mouse here, but in optics, where are they? I'm trying to point out one. They just changed the name to MKS and I don't see it. I can spell. They're not here. Oh, there they are. 
Okay, their old name was ESI, their new name is MKS. And they took 12 students from our program this year because they're uh, blowing up. And they took a good number from the optics track and a fairly decent number from the semiconductor track. As I mentioned earlier, industry is interdisciplinary and a lot of our partners take students from multiple tracks and they could even be working on the same project from these different perspectives. And if you want to learn more about our program, uh, this is our website. It's fairly easy to memorize. I'll throw it in the chat box. But what I would like to do is shut up and pass it over to Shoji and have him take over. So Shoji, you want to take over? Yeah, sounds good. Here, let me start my screen sharing really quick. Thank you. All right, can everyone see my screen OK? Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, my name's Shoji Hishida. I'm I'm happy to be here uh, to talk a little bit about my experience uh, going through the University of Oregon uh, semiconductor track, and then my time spent as an intern at as a process engineering intern at Keysight Technologies, which is based in Santa Rosa, California. So a little bit about my background, kind of uh, leading into the uh, the master's program. Uh, I was a, a student at Fresno State as an undergrad from about 2014 to 2018. Uh, one of the main experiences I got while here was working in the strongly correlated electron lab under Dr. Pei Chun Ho. And this was a lab that gave me a lot of good experience uh, with like hardware, data collection and analysis. And in particular, I felt what was very useful was just getting familiar working with vacuum systems because a lot of semiconductor processing happens under vacuum. Uh, and so I did a lot of uh, trying to measure the specific heat and thermal power of material samples down to cryogenic temperatures. So on the left, here's an image of some of the, one of our metallic crystal samples that's loaded on a um, sapphire disc for our heat capacity measurements. And here is our kind of tabletop setup where the sample probe gets mounted here. This all gets sealed up, pumped down to a vacuum. And with this system, we were able to get down to about 10 Kelvin for our measurements. And so uh, I felt, you know, as coming out of this, kind of having a background that was more in the area of like solid state physics, uh, it felt pretty natural to go into the, the semiconductor track and also just semiconductors and the things we can make with it, I thought were very interesting. So I was definitely excited to learn more. And so yeah, the program starts off in the summer. And so when I, when I was in the program, we had three courses over the summer. So the first of which, uh, as Neva mentioned, uh, is primarily theory. So we learned a lot of just the background of semiconductor device physics. And we had some labs where we were just kind of practicing the basics of you know, uh, electrical characterization. So like uh, taking measurements on like small circuits or like measuring the behavior of a capacitor just to kind of get us in some of that, that mindset and get some of that practice. And the second course, we really started getting into the the fabrication and processing side of semiconductors. So we learned what the key steps that go into making a functional device are. And we kind of started to practice those steps individually. So you've got uh, photolithography, which is used to uh, pattern your wafers. We learned some uh, oxide growth on silicon. Uh, we did like etching, both wet and dry etching, just kind of basically the individual steps, we got some practice with that. And then it really culminated in the, um, the third course, which is a project-based course where our two projects, the first of which was to try and build a functional solar cell. And then the second project was to try and build a functional uh, MOSFET. And I believe each project we had roughly two to two and a half weeks to work on this. And it was very open-ended. We, you know, we had the general, principles, the general steps, uh, but we were pretty much left to our own to come up with a plan, come up with a procedure. And so we were, I think because of the number of students, we were only in the lab every other day. So on the off days, you were basically planning out what you would do for the next day. And every morning that you were going into the lab, you were, we prepared a presentation to the rest of the class describing what our plan was, uh, what our procedures were going to be. So we got kind of got that practice, both uh, 
got the practice of going through the motions of trying to make a functioning device, but also some of that, a little bit of project management, a little bit of presentation on what you're doing. And then on top of this, uh, we had weekly professional development sessions, largely focused on like resume development and interview prep. Um, so uh, some of the pictures I have like here, this is a um, metal evaporation chamber that we use. So that is a method used to deposit thin films of metal, mainly for making contacts. Uh, here's some uh, silicon wafer pieces after we did a uh, wet, uh, I believe it was a wet oxide growth to get you basically to get a dielectric layer that you then pattern. And this was a part way through a process where we were trying to make uh, solar cells. And so this was uh, the, the silverish metal was where we were like deposited contacts, like using the metal evaporation. And this isn't a Teflon boat because I, uh, this might have been after some wet etching process that we had done. Um, and so that was the summer, which culminated in those larger projects. And then during the fall, uh, I was one of the students that went, and this is more common, is to finish out your courses at UO in the fall and then start the internship. And so I was able to take the elective courses that were offered through the master's program. And I think one of the big strengths that the UO program has is the facilities that you have access to. Um, so a lot of our lab work was done in what's called CAMCOR. It's the Center for Advanced Materials Characterization in Oregon. Uh, but so I got to take courses on electron microscopy, um, surface analysis techniques, and I got to actually spend time in the lab working with these pieces of equipment. Uh, so here's a picture of one of the, the SEM systems that we got to use. And then here's a, one of the TEM systems that we got to practice with. There was a much bigger, fancier one that's in the lab that we didn't get to touch. Uh, that uh, basically it was, my understanding was UO got this really nice tunnel in electron microscope from Thermo Fisher on the agreement that Thermo Fisher got to use it as a demo tool, but so then there's this very nice tool that the campus gets to play with. You have a great memory. <laughs> yeah, I just remember I'm like, it was so cool. Well, I think the, the main memory is how much faster you can do things on that tool. Cause there was, we were in the lab practicing for one of the final projects for the electron microscopy. And you're trying to uh, push the limits of this particular tool and get down to essentially atomic scale like resolution and on this tool, you have to spend hours trying to fine tune it. On, on the other tool, the instructor came in and was doing a demo for some, I think, elementary school students. And he like turned it on and like within five minutes, he was able to do what we had spent hours doing. So well, that could be because they difference. knew what they were doing a little bit better, but I don't, yeah, maybe the extra $4 million helps too, right? That's true. <laughs> it, it's, it's definitely a bit of both. Um, <laughs> But another thing that I was able to do um, on top of these elective courses was actually join one of the research groups for the fall term, uh, working with one of the professors who had taught one of the summer courses. And so I did a small project that was just working with um, trying to etch silicon using potassium hydroxide. And so this was a, a photo I took when I was working on that. Here's our little wafer piece. You can see the parts that were patterned and are being etched away um, in this potassium hydroxide bath. Uh, but so definitely just got to get a really uh, broad experience. Oh, and for the surface analysis class, we mainly learned about what's called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry. And those are two techniques that are very good at giving you compositional information about your samples. So definitely a lot of potential for using those in industry. Um, and so I felt that this all set me up pretty well for doing my internship as a process engineer at Keysight. So a little bit about Keysight, the, this is a company whose history dates back all the way to the early days of Silicon Valley with the founding of HP by uh, Hewlett and Packard. And, you know, one of the early, so they, you know, I think they started off like in their garage making these devices for electronic purposes. Uh, so one of the early products they made was uh, this audio oscillator that the anecdotal example is Disney purchased a bunch of them to, I think, use in the production of their, when they released Fantasia. Uh, but so this, you know, this is 
a company whose history dates back quite a while. And then it was around 1999, uh, HP, they split off Agilent Technologies, which was focused on all their different measurement equipment, whereas HP remained like the computers and printers that we typically think of. And then in 2014, Keysight split off specifically as the electronics test and measurement branch, while Agilent, I believe, remains more focused on chemistry and life sciences now. And uh, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, when I was in Dr. Ho's lab, one of the nanovoltmeters that we used was produced by Agilent. Um, so like, I was even using some of this equipment in undergrad. But yeah, so Keysight is a major supplier of electronic test and measurement. Now both equipment and like software solutions, they kind of try to make like a package deal with the two. Uh, but they make things like oscilloscopes, network analyzers, multimeters, um, and it's, to my understanding, it's fairly high-end stuff for this type of equipment. And their equipment gets used in a wide variety of industry sectors, uh, like uh, telecommunications, stuff around 5G, as well as automotive and aerospace and defense. Uh, their stuff gets used in a little bit of everything. I, I remember one of the more interesting examples I heard of how Keysight technology was being used was in automotive, they're trying to do a lot of work with self-driving cars. And so one thing that they were starting to offer was basically this test rig where you're, you take a self-driving car and you surround it with this array of like antennas and signal generators so that you're actually, rather than um, driving, you know, having to set up all these different environments to drive a physical car through, you're able to emulate the signals of different test environments. And so you're able to test uh, a wide variety of scenarios and environments much more rapidly uh, than having to create different physical scenarios. Um, and so one of the things that makes Keysight in particular unique is they have what's called vertically integrated manufacturing. What that means is they don't just make the final box that you buy, they do a lot of the manufacturing all the way down to the chip level to the finished product. And so this is where I was primarily involved was in their high frequency technology center where we worked on making integrated circuits for, for these high frequency applications. Uh, they primarily worked with gallium arsenide and indium phosphide, which are uh, better suited for these high frequencies. And whenever you're trying to make ICs, you always have to do it in a very clean environment. So the facility I got to work in at Keysight was certified as a class 100 clean room and uh, roughly speaking, that means you have like 100 particles per cubic foot of air. And I think that's particles over five microns, if, if I'm remembering that. Uh, but so overall, it's a very clean environment to work in. Uh, and you get to wear these like, they're called bunny suits. So it's the, these white suits and you basically, all, all, most of the stuff you wear, barring specific circumstances, is to keep everything else clean. Yeah, you're the dirtiest thing in the lab. <laughs> yes. Um, and so th the work that I did was specifically around a process called sputter deposition. And a lot of that was focused on the part of the manufacturing where you're trying to make inter what are called interconnects. So basically, you know, you, if you've done all the work to make your devices on the substrate, you've got your transistors or capacitors, uh, whatever is the, your actual devices, you know, in order for it to be usable, you have to be able to make electrical connections to it, both to each other and then ultimately to whatever circuit you're connecting your chip to. And so this is where interconnects come in. These are the metal lines that connect all your devices together. And it's very common now to make these 3D layered structures where you have uh, transmission metal lines that run horizontally and then uh, what are called vias that connect the layers together. And, and you can build up these, these structures. And the reason that you do these stacked layers is basically so you can fit more into a smaller space. Um, and the common material being used for these interconnects now is copper. And basically, as, as our technology advances and we can make smaller devices, the performance of these circuits is increasingly limited actually by the interconnects rather than the devices themselves. Um, so you can see like on this chart, we have this dashed line, which is 
your signal propagation delay that comes from just the, the gate, so like your transistor. But when you look at the circuit, including the interconnects, we start to get these increases in signal delays as you get smaller and smaller. Because basically, you know, your smaller devices means your interconnect structures are going to have to get smaller. So you're sending your signals through smaller wires. It's like trying to, to send water through a smaller and smaller pipe. Um, and like in earlier circuits, the, historic, the material historically used was aluminum. But you can see that by switching to copper, you're able to get significantly better performance. Uh, primarily due to one, the type of processing we're able to do with copper, but also uh, the, you know, better electrical conductivity is one of the main things. And so copper interconnects are actually not a like new technology. The IBM first pioneered this in 97. So this is one of the first chips that they released that used copper interconnects. And here's a photo of kind of what some of those structures look like if you remove everything else and just leave behind the copper. Um, but, and so these are the kinds of things that I got to work on. And so in order to make these structures for copper interconnects, you use what's called damascene processing. And the idea behind damascene processing is you have your dielectric material, uh, often an oxide, but more newer circuits tend to use stuff like different polymers or uh, it can vary. Um, but like oxides or polymers, and you, you have your layer of dielectric, and then you pattern it, and you etch some structure into the dielectric. So in this case, imagine this is a via that you're going to use to connect two different layers. Uh, this step is where my process comes in. You use sputter deposition to put down basically a seed layer that's then later used for electroplating to fill in the structure. Um, and oftentimes, with copper, you have to include a layer of a different material underneath, typically to help with adhesion, but also, uh, especially if you're working with oxide, you need a diffusion barrier because copper tends to diffuse relatively easily through oxide and can cause structures to short out. Um, so you need a material here that adheres well to copper in the dielectric and prevents the copper from diffusing out of where you want it to be. And so when you repeat this process over multiple steps, you can get something that looks like this. So this is a cross-sectional SEM image, uh, not from Keysight. I took this from an Intel presentation. But you can see these structures that are stacked on top of each other. And you know these would be running out of the page, different structures that connect to different parts of the wafer. And so the process that we use to put down that seed layer it's called sputter deposition, and this is what I worked with. And the idea is essentially you, you're in a vacuum chamber and you put your sample on a table and you have a target of the material that you want to deposit. And you, you flow in some gas and you generate a plasma. And the plasma is oriented in such a way that the positive ions of the gas are going to collide with the target. And so you have an ion that comes in you get this collision cascade of different uh, you know, atoms bumping into each other. And some proportion of the time, you're going to get an atom of the target material getting ejected from the surface. And then these will go around the chamber and deposit in a thin film on your sample. And unfortunately, also oftentimes all over the rest of the chamber. Uh, but you're able to produce uh, very thin films using this method. And so here's uh, some photos of the tool that I worked with. Uh, we called it test two. That was just the name of the particular tool. Uh, but this, this was in particular was a, a research and development tool rather than a manufacturing tool, mainly because we can see here there's five different slots for you to put targets in. So we could potentially, without opening the tool, test up to five different materials, uh, even more if you include reactive sputtering as a possibility. And but these, the reason that this is just an R&D tool is that with smaller targets, your uniformity across the wafer will suffer. Uh, typically, you want your target to be uh, noticeably big, bigger than what you're trying to deposit on. So on the production tools, these, these targets are only four inches. On the production tools, they're twice as big with an eight inch diameter. And uh, for a key site in particular, our, that whole fab is built around working with three inch wafers. 
Um, so uh, different companies might work with bigger substrates, but three inch, mainly because of the, the gallium arsenide and indium phosphide are particularly fragile. So it's a lot more difficult to work with bigger si wafer sizes with those materials. Um, so here's an example of kind of what some of the, my work would look like when we deposit and take a cross section. Here's the copper seed layer. And you have, in our case, we use like tantalum, tantalum nitride and copper. And, but you can see, you know, here's our via structure. And as you get to the sidewalls, it, it doesn't look too great. You've got all these kind of gaps. And ideally you want to like optimize out to have as smooth of a sidewall covering as possible. And that was kind of what some of my work focused on was trying to get better coverage on the sidewalls, but also you notice what gets deposited at the bottom of the structure is a lot less than what gets deposited at the top. And you, you ideally, what was happening in earlier samples was that in order to get what you needed at the bottom, there was so much here at the top that you go to plate it and it just seals off the top and leaves a giant void. Um, and so I, it, a lot of it was around optim trying to optimize for better coverage at the bottom of these via structures. And so here's some examples of what that looks like after plating. These are some test structures in, in decreasing size uh, that were taken on a sample. And so all of these look good, except you know the smallest structures that we tested tended to have voiding at the bottom because you weren't there wasn't enough there to uh, successfully electroplate the copper. Um, but for the most part, with our, our processes that we ended up with, uh, I believe either this or this, one of these two was kind of the actual target we were shooting for. And so we were able to successfully make these structures. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of what I did was kind of research and development optimization, but there were also some uh, more intense moments. This was particularly towards the beginning of when I, I joined on. There was a major project with some big upcoming deadlines and the lots that were supposed to be used as a demonstration for like a successful test started showing these critical failures where essentially, uh, so here's two different layers that we you know, de deposited. Uh, here, this would be a transmission line. This was a via layer. And basically after a certain amount of processing, uh, essentially due to thermal stress, these layers were just coming apart and so when you go to test it, it's just an open circuit. And so there was a lot of trial and error done where we were essentially testing out different thicknesses, different film stacks, different conditions, and not just on the sputtering step, but on, on the other steps around it as well to try and get this. And so we, uh, you know, over the course of the time, so I, the internships for the program are typically nine months. I finished the master's program and managed to get my internship extended to about one and a half years. And so in the time I was there, you know, started off showing these, these critical failures just after trying to do a few layers. And then uh, with some of the work I did along with others, we were able to see like these, this project, you know, successfully achieve like multiple layers of this integration without, without these failures. And so it, that was definitely, I think, one of the things I really appreciate about working in an in industry is that you get to see where your project, where your work contributes to the larger success of a project. Um, this was one of the areas that it, I was able to see that, um, as well as some other contributions I made to the project. Um, so there's there's obviously more, but these are some of the key areas that I worked on uh, while I was at at Keysight. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I, I learned a lot, even though I kind of thought I knew what you did. <laughs> uh, so we have about five minutes. Do we want to open it up to questions? If anyone wants to ask any questions, Doug? Yeah, so I, th I think that would be good. So yeah, Nima, uh, Soji, thanks a lot for uh, really nice presentations. Uh, and now let, let's let the students ask, because I mean, this is, you know, this is useful to them or should be. So any of the students? I have a question. Uh, Great. Um, so would it be possible if someone tries to do, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's related, but like wants to continue to PhD, but wants to have a job as in industry, 
So we'll go through the nine month. Would that make sense? So what I'm hearing is maybe, uh, are there possibilities for staying in industry while continuing to pursue a PhD? Yes, exactly. Okay, so I've successfully had a number of students do that. It's usually first requires the student's motivation to make it happen. No, it's not going to be easy. And you have to be, you know, uh, you, you go in the company, you show the hard work and you tell them your career goals and they don't want you to leave because they're uh, able to get so much a good work out of you. So I've seen students who come back to the U of O and get a PhD in a field relevant to what the company does. Thermo Fisher, which is one of our bigger partners has done this, like I said, a number of times because we have a lot of their tools at the university. Um, they can do research that Thermo Fisher would benefit from. So Thermo Fisher and the faculty uh, go into partnership. So the students working uh, on a project for Thermo Fisher while being compensated by Thermo Fisher, they might need to reduce their workload. Like let's say during class when in the first year when they're taking their classes and you know they can't live in Portland, but after that. So it, it's uh, possible. It's more likely if you were to work in specific companies. So usually, what you would want to do is as you're seeking out your position is be honest about your long-term goals so that you can get fit with a company that matches your long-term goals. Many people think, oh, I want to get the best paycheck, but there's a lot of other factors that you might want to consider, like where you're going to live, who you're going to work with, what kind of research you're going to do. And if a PhD is something you want to do, companies have uh, partnerships with universities, whether it's the U of O or not, um, to do these kinds of things. So it's possible at the U of O, I'm sure it's possible at other universities, um, but in terms of the company, it needs to be clear and you need to be in an environment that supports that. Some companies would be less inclined, they're more you know, focused on the bottom line, but there's other companies that are doing cutting edge research and they wanna work with faculty who have the expertise they need to solve the problem together. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes. And uh, the question could be about anything. I really appreciate you just asking a question that was uh, very specific to your desire. And if anyone here wants to talk about, I know we're at the last couple minutes you know, if you're a sophomore, uh, junior, uh, senior, you're at different stages in your career and you might have different questions. Don't be shy if, if you don't feel like uh, this graduate program pertains to you, but you're interested in something else. I have two questions. One, what's the textbook that, we, that you use for the design of experiments class? I will put it in the chat box and I will... Let you know, I, I think it's like design of experiments using JMP by a specific author, but I'll, I'll, I'll Google it while you ask me your second question. Okay. The other question is more of a rhetorical question. This is a wonderful program and you are to be congratulated. You and uh, especially since you hired, uh, since you've got one of our best uh, former students, Shoji. The question is, or more of a rhetorical question is, why don't we have a program like this? Well, Brett, so you have always a, a PhD granting institution. Now, the, the thing is that that doesn't necessarily mean so. I mean, this is a master's program, but uh, it, it also requires a lot of uh, support, I, I, I'm thinking, and a lot of support from the administration, right? I mean, NEMA? Yeah. So, so I think. I, I was at uh, your institution. I think you've asked the same question. You even prefaced it the same way. And I love that you say that because I think imitation is the best form of flattery, right? A and sincerest form of flattery. Oh, sorry, sincerest. Okay. Thank you for correcting me. I like to be corrected. I was riffing right there. So, uh, 
So I, I think that higher education needs to offer a better proposition to students who are investing and, and you know, getting a career out of it is really important. And, you know, uh, I think what you all could do is you could think about what's the local industry that you can tap into and what the expertise is within your community that you can teach to that expertise and just start creating one or two electives. You don't need to create a whole degree around it. It could be an elective series that people could take that you, the students can be confident that those skills will help them get a position at these types of companies that you all have made some partnerships with. And then it can become like a, a feedback loop. So you create one or two electives. It's not a huge cost or uh, effort. And then you can show that there is a, a, you know, a successful track record that then you can say, well, maybe we can make an undergraduate, you know, focus or maybe a graduate focus. So that's what happened at the U of O. It wasn't like one day someone said, let's make three tracks and do all this at once. It was uh, left foot, right foot, going back one step sometimes. And I, th I think sometimes people try to ch bite off more than they can chew because they're, we're all really ambitious and we want to make a big impact. But uh, I actually think small concrete steps set a good foundation and uh, we're all data driven. So if we can do a couple of experiments that show that, you know, hey, this might work on a larger scale, then we can uh, scale up. So I would encourage you all not to be discouraged if you can't have like a whole program and then, you know, finding what is the low, lowest hanging fruit for you all. So at the U of O, the faculty who started the first couple of tracks were faculty who had a background in semiconductors or polymers, and they were targeting companies in Eugene, Oregon, Corvallis, and Portland, which are just a two hour drive from one another, where there are large fabs, which have Intel, HP, and a company called Hynix, which some South Korean semiconductor company. So it was kind of, the timing was right. We had the right faculty, the right companies. And that's what kind of we now, the momentum we have to build these more like uh, unique programs. Yeah. Sorry if I took over your. No. Hey, so uh, actually, uh, Nima, I had a question. So if if I'm a student considering this, so Soji said he first heard about the programs his sophomore year, but I mean, really, it, it, it's junior and senior year when when it's getting closer to when they would apply to your program. Yeah. Correct. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that we. I've been very lucky to come to your institution and talk every year and uh, people from, you know, their senior year all the way to their freshman year are attending this colloquium or the meeting that we have over lunch and they hear about the program. And it's important before your senior year to be doing things to uh, first explore what your interests are and second to build a good application package so that when you apply to grad school, you know, you have some research experience and you can get good letters of recommendation and you can write a purpose, a statement that says, you know, I've tried material science and I think I like it and I want to pursue it at this level where you're at. So you would be applying in your senior year for graduate school. However, it's really important not to start preparing in your senior year the sooner you can start, the better. If you can find a project to work on with the faculty, or if you can get a research experience for undergrad, I'll stick that in the chat box. That's a National Science Foundation program that allows you to uh, go if there's no COVID. I believe they'll be doing a lot of those remotely in the next summer using statistics and data science to continue people's research. Those are really uh, important opportunities for people. 
But if you can't get an REU, you can get a number of other three letter acronym uh, internships, uh, whether it's an in industry or an in academia, and that will give you some research experience and maybe compensate you. So the nice thing about the REU program is you usually get paid a stipend. And if you can uh, travel, like at the U of O, we have one, you can live in the dorms for free, do research on campus and get a small stipend to, for like, you know, uh, extra expenses. It's not huge, but it's nice pocket money. And then what's really nice is you have that on your application package in terms of your experience, your resume, but you can also get a really strong letter of recommendation from a faculty outside of your institution. And if you like that school, let's say you went to UC Santa Barbara or wherever for your um, RU, and you really like that school and you're able to get a letter of recommendation from a faculty from that school, it's gonna be really potent in addition to the letters of recommendation from your home institution. So uh, I'm happy to, if anyone wants to connect, I put my email in the chat uh, box. You can email me, or if you, if you lose that email, you can reach out to Doug and he would be, I hope uh, he would be able to connect you with me. Yeah. And I can, I can help guide you, but I do know that Doug, Roger, and many of the faculty at CSU Fresno, if you just reach out to them or maybe you know, go to the office hours for your faculty, you can ask them questions in addition to your homework or you know, other uh, questions related to the class. And you have a great group of mentors at Fresno that can help you kind of navigate these next steps, depending on where you are and what, where you think you want to go. And you might not even know where you want to go. And you got to just kind of start talking to people and exploring. And maybe you try an experiment like Shoei did it at CSU Fresno and you like it or you don't. And if you, if you like it, you maybe stick with it for a while. And if you don't, you say, hey, you know, this wasn't for me. I'm going to go try maybe a, a project at CERN or Atlas where you're using more coding skills than hands-on lab skills. And you might be like, oh my God, I love coding. And so in undergrad, you got to make sure to get that exposure. But for our program, you'd be applying in uh, your senior year, but you can reach out to us at any time if you just want to learn more information. So feel free to email me and I'll talk to anyone who does. Okay. Well, okay, thanks Nima. Uh, Soji, um, are there any other questions? So if not, uh, let's thank Nima and Shoji again. Um, actually, we we recorded this, so um, like, if, if unless you guys have any objection, I'm gonna I'll send this out to the the you know the rest of the students and faculty, and uh, you. I'll also send you guys a copy too. Yeah, you know? I appreciate that. All right. Okay, everyone, have a safe and fun weekend. Okay, happy holidays, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.